Audio Jungle. I was born in 1972. That's the same year that the global think tank known as the Club of Rome released its famous Limits to Growth report, which told us that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. Nearly half a century ago, it gave us a chilling warning that if we continue with our industrial scale consumption and pollution, that we will start to see the collapse of life-supporting natural systems by the beginning of this century. And here we are facing the sixth mass extinction and rising global temperatures that are pushing us across a dangerous and irreversible tipping point. I've been alive for nearly 50 years, and I've spent most of my adult life writing about carbon pollution and that, what that means for our climate system. That time is the, fl the flicker of nothing on the scale of deep time. The time that industrial humans have been around is not much longer. And yet, in that time, to quote the novelist Richard Powers, we've turned half the planet into a factory farm for just one species. We've also raised Earth's temperature by one degree, which has brought us to this planetary emergency. But we are heading for four times that warming, which is, quite literally, an uninhabitable Earth. Most of the carbon pollution that has been put into the atmosphere that has caused this, this warming has been dumped into that atmospheric landfill in the time that you and I have been alive. These were also the glory days of neo neoliberal economics, which had us believe that we could keep polluting the atmosphere at no cost. But now that debt is demanding to be paid. We have to reverse the suicidal trend. We need a completely different way of doing things, and we have very little time in which to do it. We need a new economics and a new worldview, something that replaces predatory capitalism and selfish consumerism. We need to shed the conceit that Earth is here for us to exploit. We need to create an ecological civilization. Around the world, there is a growing community of thinkers who argue that one of the keys to this lies with indigenous knowledge systems, which put us back in symbiosis with nature. So nearly half a century after that think tank warned us about our growth trends, they recently held a global summit here in South Africa. They said they were coming home to, the, to Africa to see what the mother continent can teach us about how to create this uh, ecological civilization. Center stage at the summit was the African wisdom of Ubuntu. I am because we are. But this doesn't just apply to other humans. It applies to all of nature and speaks to the interdependence of life on Earth. The Western story has allowed us to forget that. It has its roots in dualistic thinking, the materialism of science, and capitalism. It tells us that we are separate from nature, that we are overlords of nature, that nature is there to be dominated and exploited. But we are all children of a much older cosmology, all of us, one that runs back to our hunter-gatherer parents. It's a story that tells us that we are part of nature. We are nature. Many indigenous communities are the keepers of this ancient story. It's an older form of enlightenment that could save us now. This is Domingo Pius Nampichkai. Domingo is from Ecuador, and he's part of an alliance of communities that are fighting to protect the, the Amazonian rainforest. The, the battle is against the plunder of timber merchants, corporate miners, and agribusiness. It's also against um, the governments that are willing to sell off these wild spaces to the highest bidder. But Domingo and his partners understand they aren't just fighting to protect their own small pocket of forest or to stay on their ancestral lands. They're fighting to protect something that is part of the global commons. I met Domingo a few months ago, and this is what he said. This planet is like a human body. 
If the Amazon isn't doing well, it will impact the whole continent. If Africa isn't doing well, the rest of the world will suffer. We are part of a whole, like a body. If I cut off my foot, I'm not whole. Domingo's activism connects him with the global, but his day-to-day -day life connects him with the local. Something else he said. For us, nature is medicine. It's our home. It's our family. There is no separation from nature. It's sacred. We converse with it. We talk with the trees and the rivers. For us, even a rock is a spirit. There's a unified consciousness here. And one of the ways that Domingo and this community build their kinship with human and other than human is through the ceremonial practice of using ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a tea-like brew made from plants that are specific to the Amazon, and it brings on a powerful psychedelic state. Communities here have been using ayahuasca in this way for generations. It's as much a part of their culture as going to masses for a Catholic or Friday prayers for someone of the Muslim or Jewish faiths. The mind-expanding experiences that people have in the dreamlike state brought on by ayahuasca is where this um, collective consciousness comes from and allows for a deeper communion with nature. Indigenous communities around the world have been using naturally occurring psychedelics in this way for thousands of years. But these substances are still a novelty to the modern Western world. They made their way here through a slightly unusual back door through the medical labs of the 1940s. Back then, psychiatrists had discovered that they were a useful tool to better understand the nature of the mind and human consciousness. But at the, sa the same time, they discovered that the so-called mystical experience that people have in the psychedelic state seems to release the grip of depression, end-of-life anxiety in cancer patients, and also alcohol dependence. In fact, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous had such a positive experience on one psychedelic, LSD to be specific, that he wanted to write this into the AA addiction recovery model. <laughs> there were at least three decades of serious medical research into the medical potential of psychedelics. But then in the 1960s, psychedelics escaped the medical lab and made their way into the anti-war counterculture. This was the time of the Vietnam War, and the political establishment realized that these substances may be fueling a civil disobedience that was a threat to the war machine. Nixon had them banned in the US and then bullied the United Nations into doing the same globally. This immediately shut down all medical research for nearly half a century. But there has been a revival. Johns Hopkins University, Harvard, New York University, Imperial College London. These are just some of the medical centers that are bringing psychedelic medicine back into the game. Central to some of this work is psilocybin, the psychedelic compound found in so-called magic mushrooms. There's been a flood of published research on this lately. I'm just going to give you two quick highlights. In some of the early trials run by Imperial College London, where they're using psilocybin to treat depression, they're finding that many of the people who go through their program are still reporting positive mood and behavior changes up to six months after just two supervised dosing sessions. Some of the other studies from other centers are showing that psilocybin-assisted therapy may be more effective for treating alcohol and nicotine dependence than many other mainstream therapies. Some of these researchers are comparing the rediscovery of psilocybin as a mental health treatment with the discovery of penicillin as an antibiotic nearly a century ago. Because of these promising findings, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States has declared psilocybin a breakthrough medical technology. This means that they're fast-tracking it through regulatory change so that it may be licensed for medical use there in less than five years. One of the curious side effects that these researchers have picked up on is that during the psilocybin dosing session, people experience a heightened sense of empathy and a greater connectedness 
with themselves, with others, and also with nature. One of the Imperial College researchers compares the nature awakening that people have on psilocybin with what astronauts experience. It's called the overview effect. When someone first leaves Earth's atmosphere, looks back at this blue and white swirled marble spinning in the darkness of space, and realizes this is home. This is our only home. Several of these studies are confirming what psychedelics users have been saying for decades, that these substances open our eyes to the awe of nature. They reawaken in us the ancient echoes of our roots as early humans who are part of nature. They also report distinctly pro-environmental behavior as a result of experiencing psilocybin. Here's someone from Yale University. Psychedelics cause the boundaries between self and nature to crumble. You ascribe human-like traits and emotions to nature. As a consequence, you feel empathy for nature. For Westerners who have been conditioned to be separate from nature, the nature awakening that these people are reporting on may be um, new to the journals of medical science. But for someone like Domingo, living in nature and connecting with it through what he calls the plant medicine is where this beautiful entanglement with living or non-living beings comes from. One of the second curious side effects of psilocybin and psychedelics use is a tendency towards anti-establishment thinking. Did the anti-war movement of the 1960s find psychedelics because they were already a bit counterculture? Or did psychedelics use fire up in them uh, a civil disobedience and an urgency to take on the establishment? One of the founders of the Extinction Rebellion in the UK recently went public about how her own use of ayahuasca had shifted her consciousness and uh, compelled her to start a global movement calling for mass civil disobedience in response to the climate crisis. The causes of the climate crisis are political, economic, legal, and cultural, she says. But underneath that are issues of trauma, powerlessness, scarcity, and separation. The system resides within us, and psychedelic medicines can help shift our consciousness. I've been alive for nearly 50 years. In that time, we've been warned that we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. In that time, we've released half the carbon pollution that has brought on the climate crisis. And in that time, medical research into the transformative potential of psychedelics has largely been shut down. But I've spent the past few years reporting on this story from a South African context and found a few interesting developments which could pave the way for psilocybin mushrooms to be mainstreamed in society before long. The first is there is a, a high court process due to start in the next few months, which will aim to have psilocybin mushrooms decriminalized here, much the way cannabis was in 2018. If it succeeds, then um, South Africans will be able to grow, keep, and use psilocybin in the privacy of their own homes. The second development is that once psilocybin is licensed for medical use in another country, which is likely to happen in the US and the UK in five years, if not sooner, then medical doctors here may be able to apply to the state to get a license to use this treatment in their treatment rooms, even if the substance remains illegal. And the third development is I've discovered a thriving underground community here which regards psilocybin as a potentially life-saving treatment. Like many of the researchers abroad, they say that psilocybin is too important a substance just to be kept for the treatment of sick people. It needs to be used for the betterment of well people too. They understand they're breaking the law by using it, and they do so deliberately and willfully in what they say is an act of responsible civil disobedience. They quote Martin Luther King. If a law is unjust, they have a moral duty to break that law. We live in a time where predatory economics and the Western worldview 
have largely failed us, and it's destroying life on this planet. Given what we can learn about nature connection from someone like Domingo, given what the medical community is telling us about the life-changing potential of psychedelics, could the responsible and culturally appropriate use of psychedelics like ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms help bring about the social healing and the political disruption we need in the face of this planetary emergency?